All right, we have 30 minutes, you guys. I know we're all tired. We want lunch, but I have a hodgepodge of information here, predominantly geared to the generalist otolaryngologist, things that we see day to day. Um, and I just want to stimulate conversation here. Hopefully, everyone will take something from this. So we'll get started. So eustachian tubes stuff is frustrating, right? It can be challenging. I know we all see a lot of patients, and it's common. And how we deal with these patients um, is, I would argue, a challenging and sometimes frustrating thing. So I think it's nice to come together and talk about what we all do to, to satisfy patients and make them feel like their office visit's worthwhile and make them feel like they're actually getting treated well. So what I want to do here is I want to talk about how we all manage the stuff. We're, I know we hit a lot of this already. And then I'll give a little spiel on eustachian tube balloon dilation. But more importantly, I agree it's a great thing. And I do it. I do it often. But I think you need to understand the data behind it. And we're briefly going to talk about that. So just a few things, simple but important to know. Cartilaginous eustachian tube. And then there's a bony component. The million dollar number to remember is 24 millimeters. That's where the isthmus is. That's where um, the junction between the cartilaginous portion and the bony portion happen. When we talk about all these devices of the eustachian tube balloon, they're all designed so they don't go past this bony isthmus. Because if they do, that's where petrous carotid and the petrous part of the temporal bone lives. So in theory, if you stay here, you're safe. It amazes me that we all go through our training and we all think about middle ear stuff, but no one ever talks about the anatomy here and understanding the anatomy of the eustachian tube. This is a left side uh, 30 degree endoscope in the left nose. In order to understand the eustachian tube, you have to understand that posteriorly medially, that's where the medial cartilage lamina is. And then anterior laterally, that's the membranous wall of the eustachian tube. Two muscles that no one ever talks about that are very important is the tensor villi palatini and the levator villi palatini. I love this picture. This picture, you're in the back of the nose with the 30 degree endoscope looking into the left sided eustachian tube. Again, you have the medial cartilage labina right there. The levator villi palatini is this muscle connected to the cartilage right there. And then you have your tensor villi palatini here. This picture, cross section, same thing. So the cartilaginous uh, posterior medial part right there, that's the levator villi palatini. That's the tensor villi palatini right here, the anterior lateral wall. If you put all this together, that's what, where you're looking at. And what happens when we swallow, the first muscle that activates is this levator villi palatini. That pulls this cartilaginous portion to anchor it, and then the tensor villi palatini fires to contract to open the valve. That's where the problem is. So when we talk about eustachian tube dysfunction, it's, it's classified simply. You have your obstructive dysfunction, your barrel challenge, and your patulous. So we're going to start simple. As general otolaryngologists, we see this all the time. And, and Dr. Lee, I'll, I'll start with you. So let's say someone comes to you, you're in your practice, a 55-year-old person, and they say, my right ear is driving me crazy. I saw my PCP many times. You know, they told me I had fluid. I tried some Flonase and Claritin. Their temps are normal. You have a type A temp, normal hearing test, and you look in that right ear and you see this. What do you do? And they, keep in mind, they paid a $50 copay. They're so excited. They waited four weeks to get in your office. And what do you do? Testing. Okay. <clears throat> uh, in terms of like com completing the rest of the history, making sure in terms of allergy, like what other aller allergic symptoms they have, I'm assuming they they've been clear from that perspective. Um, I do have a longer discussion with them in terms of what eustachian tube uh, dysfunction is like in terms of those um, symptoms, because a lot of, lots of times it's the first time that they're hearing about it. Um, you know, in my training as well as with Dr. Backus, like. Um, we, I have done eustachian tube balloon dilations, but I do offer them uh, cartilage beta T tubes at times too. Um, so I think a trial of uh, doing tubes, um, I would not do just the myringotomy in terms of uh, helping alleviate intermittent. So right now they're in your office. Are you going to have them start a Flonase trial? Would you 
you, you, would you do a mirroring God me today, right, when they're in their office? How, how, like, how would you manage this situation? In terms of, one, clarifying how, how they use their Flonase and Claritin, um, I, I would start medically managing-wise, uh, making sure that they use Flonase consistently, having a good allergy regimen. I, would, I, I had them start a good uh, nasal saline irrigation um, just to start off and kind of get a new basis. And normally people are pretty um, receptive to starting off with conservative management. How long would you try conservative management? When are you gonna see that person back? I, I have them back in like six weeks okay. normally. Next question to the panel is, I know this is a simple question, but I wanna like, think about this. What does a type, ta type A tympanogram mean? They're okay for right, right then at that snapshot. <laughs> So I would, I would kind of step back a little bit, and if uh, in terms of the fullness and pressure, they're obviously pretty vague symptoms. They have a, what looks like a safe eardrum. I don't see any fluid. They've got normal hearing. So I would probably talk to them a little bit about what they're doing with their ears, make sure they're not using Q-tips, make sure they're doing some moderate dry ear precautions, talk to them about bruxism, um, any clenching, anything like that. Um, obviously... Fullness and pressure I'm not so worried about, but a good head and neck exam, just make sure you're not overlooking something else. And then for uh, my sort of feeling is, it, and then obviously a smoking history, see if there's any sort of reversible stuff, if they're whatever, woodworker, doing painting, something else that might be an irritant for the nasopharynx that might be contributing. Could be more unilateral, but um, probably obviously more likely bilateral. And my usual regimen, if, if I really think there's an allergic component or that's even if they, even if the only thing they have that's allergic is their ears. Um, my usual regimen is Flonase for two months. If that doesn't work, add Azelastin on top of that. Um, and it, use the second generation antihistamine at the same time. But um, I would be slow to progress to doing a tube or probably much of anything. I think as you indicated though, the tympanogram is just a snapshot. So we don't know what it was yesterday or the next day. But if the eardrum looks normal, the tympanogram is normal, then again, I think you can have a lot of discussion with a patient that this isn't dangerous as much as it's annoying. <laughs> so, oh, go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to add um, counseling, counseling, counseling. I think that's the the my um, message for the day. Sometimes, you know, just doing a nasal uh, an endoscopic exam, showing the patient their nasal anatomy that they have edema, that their their turbinates were enlarged, um, and then showing them a picture of what a normal one looks like on the screen from your computer, and saying you're not using not in a kind way. If you used your nasal spray more effectively, oftentimes, this would decrease the lining of your nasal passage. The same thing that lines your nose, lines your eustachian tube. So if you treat your nasal congestion effectively, sometimes your eustachian tube symptoms will improve. And showing them how to administer the nasal spray, because oftentimes the primary cares don't either take the time to do it or don't actually know how to effectively do it. So do you guys believe, does anyone in this audience believe you could have a, uh, like a subclinical symptomatic eustachian tube dysfunction with a type A tympanogram? So um, one thing I would add to that is, you know, if you, I, I get this a lot, we all do, right? And I get them after they've been through other ENTs, right? And they're like, my ear's full or my ear hurts. And, you know, the first thing I ask them is actually just clinically, when your ear feels full, uh, is there a change in your hearing? Right, so because it could be, you know, it could be true transient eustachian tube, obstructive eustachian tube dysfunction, but a lot of times it's something else, right? Uh, and so that's the first question I ask them. And if they say that no, my hearing's absolutely fine, you know, uh, and I look at their ear, and I always look and have them do a vowel salve, and if you know it instantly insufflates, then the fullness is probably due to something else. Do you ever do a diagnostic myringotomy right in the office, right then and there, to prove never. yes or no? Never. Never. Um, there's no reason for that because, like, you're not going to relieve anything. Uh, you're causing a hole uh, at that point. Um, and sometimes, you know, I've, I get referrals and patients have already tried that, right? And, you know, I can tell you invariably if there's pretty much, if there's normal physical exam and they don't get uh, hearing loss and also there's no consistent, you know, uh, history of uh, discomfort or ear pain, uh, uh, prolonged symptoms with altitude changes, it's probably TMJ or yeah. something else. So real quick, I, I want to move through this, but who believes in oral steroids for eustachian tube dysfunction? Does anyone prescribe oral steroids for eustachian tube dysfunction? How about um, like Singular? Does anyone do Singular for eustachian tube dysfunction? Interesting. We're going to move past that. 
If someone comes with this to your office with a serous effusion in the left ear, how long do you wait to let it go away versus offering a tube? I just follow the guidelines, three months, I have a big discussion with them. I mean, lots of times they have like travel plans and stuff, so I really go in terms of what's their quality of life, what do they have planned, talk to them about the risk and benefits, but I do tell them about the guidelines and that at the end of the day, I would recommend just waiting. Would you, off, would you do a tube on the first time you meet this person if you see that? No, I wouldn't. So I would say, depending on the history again too, I mean, if this is the only event and that's what it looks like, I'd probably try to get them to insufflate their ear, see if they can get it to move. If You know what, if there's, can't tell if there's a bubble in there or not, but if it's completely opacified, um, I wouldn't worry too much. If they were, said they're going on a trip and it was completely opacified, I wouldn't worry about it too much. If they're going on a week trip to Europe and their ear looks like this, they got a multiple flights, I'd probably would be convinced to put a tube in. Yes. Spray. The question is how medically would you manage that? When a patient presents with a fusion that's subacute, um, maybe four to six weeks or so, um, do, you, do you offer oral steroids at that time? Um, do you antihistamines, Flonase, um, decongestants, Valsalva maneuvers? So me personally, quite honestly, I do give Medrol dose packs for, for this. Um, I do. Um, I tell them to do Flonase, I'll do Astelin, a Medrol dose pack, um, but if they're bothered for it, by it, I I would, uh, I mean, if I give them the option, and if they want that a tube for this, I would. Uh, three days, but no no more. I just think it's interesting to to talk about the the variety of of treatment options. So next case, let's. This is a different sixty seven year old female. She comes in and she says, intermittently I get fullness and pressure in the right ear. I have autophony, I hear myself breathe, I hear myself talk, and sniffing makes me feel better. When you look at them, you see excursions of the TM with ipsilateral breathing, and we talked about patulus. I know we've already beat this. This is a real patient that I, that I had. This is their audiogram there. And literally, if they sniff in, you see that atrophic membrane, it goes back and forth, back and forth. So the reason why I bring this up is just to review patulus, you know, things to think about, the autophony, aerophony, I f it gets worse with exercise. When you see pa patients tell you, I exercise and then I get my ears full, think patulus. Um, if they put their head down and they get the venous congestion and they feel better, again, think patulus. If they've had recent weight loss, and these are all options of things you can do. Um, do any of you guys can, I know we've already done this, but speak to the, any other options of patulous treatment? If they have, if their eardrum looks like that, it's got a lot of redundancy to it, then that, that's whatever they call them, the popper sniffer group yes. or whatever. They're basically, they've, they've caused some pathologic changes in their drum. And so it does cause a noticeable hearing effect for them and they really it's very difficult for them to get out of that cycle because their drum is basically so floppy so in, in the rare case that they progress to that point then I do offer them a cartilage tympanoplasty you just took it out of my mouth perfect so I agree and I do as well um, Dr. Bojad this is what we were talking about earlier so there is good data to support cartilage tympanoplasty for patulous eustachian tube and if you look at these pictures down here I don't want to use the pointer a is normal. There shouldn't be any airflow back up into the eustachian tube. For B, if there is, the idea behind it is they feel the eardrum vibrates and they feel that. That's why they hear themselves breathe. That's why they hear themselves talk. So for C, if you go in and you rebuild that eardrum with cartilage, you take away those fluctuations and there is good data to support that they feel better. So in an ear like this, I would have no reservations of doing a, a huge island cartilage tympanoplasty to fix that. How about if the eardrum was normal? Then I would not. Well, I, so. Because most patients with patches your station tubes don't have an ear like that. Yeah. So I, a normal looking. I, I would be, I would probably, uh, I would be very hesitant to do that in a normal. I would try, like you said earlier, filler um, at the, the torus. I would, 
What I would do is I would weight the eardrum. So I would get bacitracin or mupuricin or something and put it on the eardrum and see, are you better? And if they're really distraught by it and if they feel better, then maybe, but I, I'd be cautious. I'd be really cautious too for, I've, I've seen this twice where people had multiple eustachian tube dilations because they, they have the dilation, they feel better for a couple months. They have another dilation, they feel better for a couple months. And then they, they come in and they want another dilation. You look in their ear and you see that eardrum. And whether they originally had eustachian tube dysfunction and they've been sort of over dilated, that's one possibility. Uh, the other is that they never really actually had eustachian, obstructive eustachian tube dysfunction in the first place. So I think you always have to just remind yourself, you want to be 100% certain you're not dealing with the other pathology before you go in and dilate them again because the patient themselves is convinced that the dilation actually helped. And then you look and see that exam with the, you know, the distorted eardrum with it basically moving as they're breathing. And you have to tell them, despite that so many people have told them this was the right thing to do, you're trying to tell them exactly the opposite. So it, it takes a lot of counseling to convince them. <laughs> this is like the million dollar slide. This is an oral fullness. I stole this from Dennis Poe. He gave a, a great talk on eustachian tube issues. Um, this is oral fullness to a T. I follow this every single day in my clinic. So the yellow box, if someone comes to you with oral fullness and they have retracted drum, there's fluid there, and in your mind you say, wow, that's easy, this is obstructive eustachian tube function, the answer is easy. You can put a tube in that ear, you can think about balloon dilation, that's the easy part. If you look in the ear and their tympanic membrane looks totally normal, and then you ask them, hey, are you barrow challenged? When you fly, do you have trouble equalizing pressure? And if the answer is yes, I think you station to balloon dilation. If you ask them, do you have autophony? And if you see the eardrum moving with the, the nasal breathing, then you think patchless you station tube and we, you defer the treatment like we talked about earlier. But what about the people that you look and it's normal and there's no barrel challenge, there's no autophony, the eardrum looks perfect. That's when you get down to your other players here. And I think the biggest one is the TMJ, the, t the temporal mandibular issues. I probably tell people they have TMJ problems more than they have ear problems on a day-to-day -day clinic that I see. I'll tell you the best thing I've ever done in my private in practice is find a good TMJ specialist, not an oral surgeon, but a TMJ specialist that you can refer these people to because at the end of the day, them getting better is what matters. Um, you always have to think about canal dehiscence. Uh, getting a CT scan to prove or disprove that is important, and then you think, like an endolymphatic high drops picture, if there is any audio metric data to support that. Again, the key to, uh, the other thing to talk about this slide is the sniffers. So the idea behind the sniffers, we used to call it habitual sniffing, that's not what's happening. They're underlying patchless, so they hear themselves breathe, they hear themselves talk, so they sniff to reduce that pressure to make them feel better, but then they realize they feel plugged so they pop to pop it back out. And over time, if you do that over and over again, it leads to a drum that looks atrophic like you guys saw. I love this picture here. I show this to people, people with TMJ issues. Right here, this is the eustachian tube cut in a, a cross section. And if you see those levator villi palatinis and the tensor villi palatini muscles that we talked about live right next to the medial pterygoid, which is 500 in that picture. So people who have stress on the medial pterygoids, which are the muscles of mastication, feel it in their eustachian tube, and it's because it's literally right next door. If you Google SOS TMJ Rescue in this bottom left picture here, this guy named Hitesh Patel wrote a book. He's a TMJ specialist. In the foreword of that book, describes a person to an ENT clinic who's been told they have a million ear infections. I print this for patients and I say, read the forward. You can find the PDF online. It's very helpful for people. So real quick, we're getting to the end. I just want to talk about um, some stuff on eustachian tube balloons. Just so you all know, our academy in 2019, we do have a consensus statement. I have a template that I wrote out that I submit to insurance companies when they say it's investigational. And I literally have a letter to say, there's so much data supporting it. Just so you know, the indications per our academy, chronic, greater than three months, negative pressure with B or C temps, or being barrow challenged. 
I encourage you guys, whoever's doing this, to understand the data. The data, the biggest, the best study we have is Dennis Poe, 2017 in Laryngoscope here. And I'm, I know this is going to get boring, but real quick, it's a prospective multi-center study, randomized control. They had two groups. You give some people some nasal steroid spray versus nasal steroid spray and balloon dilation. The inclusion criteria were adults. They had to have failed medical management, and they just had to have uh, persistent abnormal tympanograms for greater than three months. And this is, this is all you need to know here. If you look, so they, the, the first time point they did was six weeks. The balloon group had uh, significantly more normalization of tympanograms compared to the medical management. 52% of the balloon uh, normalized tympanograms versus only 13% of medical management. If you look at improved tympanograms, the balloon group, 63% had improved tympanograms versus only 25% of the medical management. At 24 weeks, 62% of the balloon group had normalization of tympanograms. They couldn't make a comparison at 24 weeks because they allowed all the people from the medical management to switch over at six weeks, and like 80% did, which means medical management really doesn't, the data behind medical management isn't very good, and most of them turn to balloons. If you look at the EDTQ7 scores, and I suggest you guys do this, who people are, are doing balloons, it's helpful. At six weeks, 56% of the balloon group reduced down to 2.1, which is only 8.5% uh, in the medical management group. Again, statistically significant. In 2019, they went a year later to see if the, the results were long-standing, and quite simply, the answer is yes. At one year, 56% of the people stayed with normalized tympanograms, and then the normalized ED2Q7 at, at a year was 60% as well. So really, that's all I wanted to, to say. I, I quote this as, a, when I offer it to people, I don't say it's a guarantee. I say the data shows 60. I know more recent data is showing up to 80%. So I give people, I say 60 to 80%. And quite honestly, I would make the argument, I don't like doing this in the OR because I don't, I don't like the idea of putting someone to sleep to do something that's only going to work 60 to 80% of the time which is why I think it's important to learn and to offer this in the office. Um, and I probably do one or two a month, and I've never had an issue, and I, Dr. Waterman did a great job. Um, this is what I do, quite simply. I have them have a driver. They take a Halcyon or Triazolam about an hour before with a one 500 milligram Tylenol. And then I just have Afrin and 4% topical lidocaine, Pledgets. I don't inject anything I never have in two years. Um, I've never had a problem. I just put the pledges in the nose for five, 10 minutes. I usually do this in another room and I'm still seeing patients while they, they're getting anesthetized. 10 to 15 minutes later, you just come in with the zero degree endoscope, push those pledges further back right at the torus. Another 10 to 15 minutes, you stop and then you just go ahead with the balloon um, and that's pretty much it. Um, I tell them for a week after not to Valsalva, don't blow your nose. The reason being is if you've created a false passage, which is rare, but it can happen, um, you'll get the subcutaneous air. After a week, I tell them to gently modify Valsalva every hour while they're awake for three weeks. And then I see them back a month later, I have them fill out an ETDQ7 score. Then I gotta be honest with you, in the right person, my experience has been this is helpful. Um, I don't know if any you guys have anything else to add to that, but that's really what I wanted to talk about. The one last thing I'll say, just hopefully this is helpful. It, I practice in Illinois, Anthem, Blue Cross, uh, this is their criteria. It used to be that you had to have abnormal tympanograms B or C, but this changed. If you look at number four, it's, this is Anthem Blue Cross, for where I live, it's abnormal tympanograms or symptoms consistent with barrow challenge. So technically, to get a predetermination for this, you do not need to have those 
tympanograms if you can document they've, they have barrel challenge problems. And I'll end with that. One thing I'm going to add, I just uh, learned that balloon dilation is now uh, FDA approved for ages eight and older. Yeah. And so that's going to be a little bit of a game changer, I think, moving forward once uh, we get insurance coverage for that. So you said, said FDA approved for what? For, uh, for up chronic obstructive uh, for yeah. folks eight, eight years yeah. and up. So it's no longer 22. That number is just yeah. gradually declining. And they say it's because the eustachian tube for the, the length of the cartilaginous eustachian tube in an eight-year-old is, sorry, yeah. they say that uh, it's safe and it's approved because the length of the eustachian tube, the cartilaginous portion, uh, in an eight-year-old is pretty much adult size. So it's safe and uh, there's su su uh, data to support it. So how do you know that they're not patchless? I mean, like what is the pearl to make sure you're not about to dilate a patchless eustachian tube? Um, physical exam. You know, uh, I, always, I always do a microscopic exam and I have them, number one, do the Valsalva. So if they open up, you know that that's not the issue, right? If they auto-insufflate. And then the other is just to kind of observe. Uh, sometimes for, for really severe cases, you'll see uh, subtle deflections of the tympanic membrane or you just have them just gently sniff in. You know, most of us, if we're just gently sniffing in or just, or even vigorously, the eustachian tube's not, you know, at a constant open state, you're not gonna see the eardrum move in. If you do, then it's probably patchless and then you can confirm it with the uh, uh, endoscope. What, I'm curious um, for, the, um, for all of you, uh, what, how, what, what, how much barrow challenge is enough barrow challenge to, to say that somebody's barrow challenged? What's your threshold for, for doing a procedure on them? I think, at least in my experience, some of the happiest patients in terms of success with the eustachian tube dilation, at least in the patients that I've seen, are the ones that have a barrow challenge problem. Um, and most of them tend to be people that are either driving, like, for example, business people that are doing driving over the mountain range back and forth to eastern Washington, or their flight attendants, pilots, divers, things like that. Um, they te in my experience, they tend to be some of the happiest people. Um, and so I base it on their what they tell me in terms of how much of a problem it is. And if they're making it all the way to see me, usually it's a pretty big problem. <laughs> and for those patients, you know, in addition to that, I will always have them see a TMJ specialists to rule that out before proceeding. Yeah. I think if they, you know, on nasal endoscopy, you find findings of um, chronic allergies. I have a, a great allergist that I work with um, in tandem, and I'll often send them for allergy testing to see if that's effective. History-wise, um, people that moved recently from like a dry state to Seattle, if, like, and then I asked them about home conditions. Um, when I was in Atlanta, there was a lot of mold problems that uh, we would frequently have them see allergy. I, I agree. If, I, if the nose looks like there's an allergic component, I always offer it. And the other thing I'll say to answer the earlier question is, if I'm going to do a balloon dilation on someone, the way I think of it is I just have to believe that they have obstructive eustachian tube dysfunction. Whether that means I can see it, whether it means there's fluid, and if the eardrum looks okay, I, I, I have no, I'll do it like what Dr. Bojrab said, I have no problem poking a hole in it. And I, I just send them on their way and I say, you know, it's probably going to heal in a week. Pay attention. Does it help you? Make an appointment with me in two weeks. Come back. If you say, oh, wow, I feel so good, that means they probably had an obstructive eustachian tube component. If it didn't help them, then I, then I wouldn't do it.